Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. students and welcome to Swayam Prabha channel. I am Swati Solanki, Assistant Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. I am taking up the course titled as White Collar Crimes and in today's session we will be taking the Prevention of Money Laundering Act further and discussing the part 2. The objective for today's session are as follows. To continue discussing the section 3 after 2019 Amendment Act, authorities under the Act, provisional attachment and lastly confirmation of attachment by the adjudicating authority. Now as we saw previously that section 3 explanation which has been added after the 2019 Amendment Act, the word and has to be read as or which means that along with the four other ingredients like possession, acquisition, concealment or use. Apart from these ingredients, what was required in the unamended act, the projection or claiming it to be as untainted property. Now if we look at the explanation after clause D, the after the word use or has been added. So what does it mean? It means that the word and is now to be read as or. Now in the unamended act before 2019, if we refer to this slide, there were two conditions which were required to be fulfilled to prosecute a person or to criminalize him under the provision that is section 3. First, mere possession, acquisition, use or concealment of proceeds of crime would not tantamount to the offence of money laundering, meaning that these ingredients alone will not fulfil the requirements of the offence or the ingredients of the offence under section 3. In addition to either of these four, what was further required? The provision mandates that the enforcement directorate must show that after the commission of the scheduled offence, the person accused of money laundering has knowingly assisted others or indulged involved himself in a separate criminal activity of converting the tainted property to untainted. So what is further required concurrently? Projection of the proceeds of crime as untainted or claiming the proceeds of crime to be untainted. Now what has been the impact when we read the word and to be as or? Look at the right side that from where this requirement of amending the law had emerged. Previously, I have referred to the Financial Action Task Force. Now, it is the global standard setting body which talks about that what should be the standards that countries need to adopt for taking the counter actions against the money laundering or terror financing. Now, this body meets and looks at what are the different types of money laundering and what is the evaluation of each country in order to combat the money laundering. Now if we look at that during the mutual evaluation report in 2010, it was realized that under the Indian context, the word concealment, possession, use or acquisition have not been criminalized. On the other side, if we look at the Palermo Protocol of the year 2000, it requires that such activities should also to be criminalized. Hence, Section 3 of the PMLA has been proposed to include these activities under the offence of money laundering. Now, if we look at the Palermo Protocol, Article 6 in particular, the criminalization of laundering of proceeds of crime. Article 6, Clause 1 provides 
each state party shall adopt in accordance with the fundamental principles of its domestic law such legislative and other measures as may be necessary to establish as criminal offences when committed intentionally now we refer to the sub clause a the conversion or transfer of property knowing that such property is the proceeds of crime for the purpose of concealing or disguising the illicit origin of the property or for helping any person who is involved in the commission of the predicate offence to evade the legal consequences of his or her action now comes the important part that is the concealment or disguise of the true nature source location disposition movement or ownership of or rights with respect to property knowing that such property is the proceeds of crime now what is the essential requirement if we look at article 6 clause 1 sub clause clause a sub clause 2 is that that when the person is trying to conceal or disguise in the true nature of the property he should have the knowledge that these proceeds are the proceeds of crime so what is the important criteria that when he is trying to conceal something he has the knowledge from where the proceeds have originated however if we look at the amendment of 2019 in particular we see that the great departure has been made now this word knowledge provides a check that for a person to be prosecuted he must have some knowledge now if we do away with this requirement anybody who is an innocent person who is purchasing the property which could have been bought using the ill gotten money and this person has no knowledge let's say now today he is in the possession of that property when the investigating agency is coming after the property because they are doing the audit trail they will not know whether this person who has purchased the property had in fact had the knowledge that this property was was purchased utilizing the proceeds of crime so essentially speaking that the word knowledge of taking the proceeds of crime which was necessary ingredient under the palermo protocol article 6 that has been not provided after the amendment of 2019 so what we say that sine qua non which was the essential ingredient has not been adopted under the amendment act of 2019 now when we read the provision of section 3 it was the only offense under the pmla act of 2002 now after having discussed what the offense is it becomes important for us to first understand that what are the authorities under the pmla act in the last lecture i had made a reference to two authorities one is the investigating agency which is the enforcement directorate and the other one is the adjudicating authority which has been constituted under section 6 of the pmla act now what is the purpose of having adjudicating authority the civil proceedings of confirmation of the provisional attachment that is done by the enforcement directorate is been done by the adjudicating authorities so let's see what is the composition of this adjudicating authority now it is a three members body one is the chairperson and then there are other two members in this body section 6 subsection 2 in particular provides that an adjudicating authority shall consist of a chairperson and two other members provided that one member each shall be a person having experience in the field of law administration finance or accountancy so when we talk about one person is from the field of law is there a necessary or minimum threshold that is to be taken care of it is been further provided under subsection 3 it says the person from the field of law necessarily should be appointed as a district judge second when we are looking at the member of you know a uh, indian legal service he should have held the position as grade 1 officer now we refer to the member from finance accountancy or administration he must have necessary qualification 
as may be prescribed by the central government in this regard. There are other subsections as well, but we just want to understand the composition of the authority and these are the relevant subsections. Talking about the Directorate of Enforcement, which is the investigating agency under the Act, Section 48 becomes relevant. Now, within this section, we see what is the hierarchy of the officers in the Directorate of Enforcement. Let's read the provision. Let's refer to Section 48, Authorities under Act. There shall be following classes of authorities for the purposes of this Act, namely Clause A. Director or Additional Director or Joint Director Clause B Deputy Director Clause C Assistant Director Clause D Such other class of officers as may be appointed for the purposes of this Act. Now when we talk about the Enforcement Directorate, who are these officers? We have just discussed. But who appoints these uh, you know, officials? So Section 49 comes to the rescue. Appointment and powers of authority and other officers. The central government may appoint such persons as it thinks fit to be the authorities for the purposes of this Act. It has been provided under subsection 1. Subsection 2. Without prejudice to the provisions of subsection 1, the central government may authorize the director or an additional director or a joint director or a deputy director or an assistant director appointed under that subsection to appoint other authorities below the rank of an assistant director. They may impose some restrictions on the powers to be exercised by these authorities or officials under the provisions of this Act. Now, what do these authorities do? When we were discussing the flowchart under the Part 1 session of PMLA, we discussed that what is the whole procedure when ED starts investigating Following the audit trail of the proceeds of crime, they want to maintain the status quo of the property. Now, how this status quo is being maintained? The Enforcement Directorate provisionally attaches the property. This provisional attachment needs to be then confirmed by the adjudicating authority that is done under the Section 8 and the final confiscation of the property is being done after the trial gets concluded under Section 43 of the PMLA Act. Now, there are three stages of order of attachment as I just discussed. Let's once again go back to what is the meaning of attachment under Section 2, Clause D. Attachment means prohibition of transfer, conversion, disposition or movement of property by any order issued under Chapter 3. So, this order of attachment passes through three different stages. Provisional attachment, order by director under section 5, subsection 1. Confirmation of the provisional order by adjudicating authority under section 8, subsection 3. Finality to the order of attachment under section 8, subsection 3, clause B. Read with section 5, once the guilt of the accused is proved in the trial court. The property stands confiscated in the name of the central government in the manner provided under section 9. Before we get into the subsections to section 5, let's say the enforcement director, it summons any alleged offender. Now, during the inquiry, the enforcement directorate finds some relevant material against this person. Now, these materials would constitute the relied upon documents, which in short are called as RUD. Now, when we go through these material evidences, it was realized by the Enforcement Directorate that this person had tried to do any of the act which has been defined as an ingredient of the offence under Section 3 of the PMLA. The Enforcement Directorate then would write Enforcement Case Information Report which is called as ECIR in short. Now, after registering the ECIR, mind you, this is not equivalent to FIR, but if we look at all the technicalities, one may say that it is as good as FIR. 
the caution that needs to be exercised in here is that that FIR is the registration of the offence that has been already committed. But what enforcement directorate contends that at that stage they are at the stage of making the preliminary inquiry. They are asking the alleged accused or the witnesses in order to find out whether they have in fact committed the offence of money laundering or not. So in that sense the enforcement directorate contends that we are at the stage of making the preliminary inquiry. We do not know whether this person has in fact committed the actual offence or not. So we cannot say that ECIR is equivalent to the FIR. So then the question arises at what stage do we really say the proceedings of investigation has really started under the PMLA Act. We will see after we discuss the ingredients of section 5 that what is said to be the original complaint in the context of the PMLA Act. Now under subsection 1 to section 5 when the director or the deputy director has a reason to believe and this reason to believe has to be taken down in writing that any person is you know in the possession of the proceeds of crime then that property needs to be provisionally attached. For how long this property can be attached? Earlier this period was for 100 days but after the amendment it is now been increased to 180 days. So we will look into why this time period has also been increased. Now when we look at this reason to believe, it is very important for us to know whether this reason to believe is just mere suspicion or there must be some prima facie evidences available against the probable offender under the PMLA. Subsection 2 provides when I have provisionally attached your property immediately I need to send the report of it to the higher authority that is the civil adjudicating authority under the act which is the adjudicating authority. Now where we look at how this report has to be forwarded it is provided under the 2005 rules pertaining to the forwarding the copy of attachment to the adjudicating authority. Subsection 3 says that let's say the period of 180 days have expired. What happens to this order of provisional attachment? Is ED going to deprive you of your property without following the due process? We will look into that. Now subsection 4 says that when enforcement directorate has made provisional attachment, whether it hampers your right to enjoy the possession. So we will be talking about that too. Subsection 5 then provides that the complaint to be forwarded to the adjudicated, adjudicating authority within 30 days from the date of order of the provisional attachment. So this is the overview of section 5. We are going to then read each subsection one by one. So let's look at the heading. Section 5, attachment of property involved in money laundering. Subsection 1 where the director or any other officer not below the rank of deputy director authorized by the director for the purposes of this section has a reason to believe the reason for such belief to be recorded in writing on the basis of the material in his possession. So when we look at material in his possession, these are the evidences collected during the inquiry made by the enforcement directorate. A person is summoned under section 50 of the act, then ED asks about please reveal the sources from where you have generated this pro property or this asset. If they are not able to answer that, the ED may take this, that when you do not answer, ED may take this as well that this is a suspicion which can be raised against him this person is not cooperating with us. So there is a reason to believe that he must be trying to conceal the original source of this asset which will be an offence under section 3 of the PMLA. So non-cooperation by the witness or by the person who has been called under section 50 may constitute for a reason to believe that can be used in here. 
Now, when we talk about this reason to believe as discussed, it just does not mean mere suspicion. There has to be prima facie evidence is available. That is the theoretical aspect of it. But in reality, something else has been alleged to have been happening, right? So when we say that some material is available and this material further says that any person is in the possession of proceeds of crime and B, such proceeds of crime are likely to be concealed, transferred or dealt with in any manner which may result in frustrating any proceedings relating to the confiscation of such proceeds of crime under this chapter. There are two things which have been provided in here. First, that enforcement directorate believe that the person is in the possession of the proceeds of crime. B, if enforcement directorate do not make the provisional attachment, there is a chance that this person may conceal or transfer or dispose of the proceeds of crime in any manner. In these two contexts, the enforcement directorate can proceed to provisionally attach the property. Now look further at the last part of the provision. He may by order in writing provisionally attach such property for a period not exceeding 180 days from the date of the order in such manner as may be prescribed. So whenever we look at the word manner, we have to refer to the rules which are appended to the PMLA Act. Now there are three provisos to the subsection 1 of section 5. First, that when we talk about the person who may be in the possession of the proceeds of crime, we may be referring to the person who is the accused in the scheduled offence. Now what is the important ingredient that it is to be noted? The person should have committed the scheduled offence. Only then the offence under the money laundering can be meted out. So, let's say this person has committed the crime of ransom. He has taken some money and in the scheduled offence, a charge sheet has been filed under section 173 of the CRPC. Or, let's say the complaint has been filed before the competent court. So, this first profile so pertains to those situations when we are referring to the accused under the scheduled offence. This is a necessary condition if we look at the first proviso. The second proviso talks about any property of any person. So how these two provisos are different, we have to understand the distinction between the two. So first, let's read the proviso number one. Provided that no such order of attachment shall be made unless in relation to the scheduled offence a report has been forwarded to the magistrate under section 173 of the CRPC or a complaint has been filed by a person authorized to investigate the offence mentioned in that schedule before a magistrate or court taking the cognizance of the scheduled offence as the case may be or a similar report or complaint has been made or filed under the corresponding law of any other country. Now let's understand what is the last part of this proviso. As you all know that the scheduled offence may have been committed under the jurisdiction of India, but the proceeds of crime have been taken outside the Indian jurisdiction and these proceeds of crime are located elsewhere. Now let's say the complaint has been filed in the other country, in the corresponding law. So whenever we refer to the accused of money laundering, it does not matter even if the proceeds of crime are being taken outside. Now proviso 2 says, provided further that notwithstanding anything contained in the first proviso, any property of any person may be attached under this section if the director or any other officer not below the rank of deputy director authorized by him for the purposes of this section has a reason to believe and this reason has to be taken down in writing. The reasons for such belief to be recorded in writing on the basis of material in his possession 
that if such property involved in money laundering is not attached immediately under this act, the non-attachment of the property is likely to frustrate any proceeding under this act. Now, there are two important things which are to be noted in here. It says any person, any property of any person. Can it so happen that let's say I being the accused, right, under the scheduled offense, I have purchased the property in the name of my friend, relative or employee. Now, when ED is doing the audit trail, this other person is holding that property. However, the control is exercised by the accused of the scheduled offense. Now, if ED will wait that first the charge sheet needs to be filed against the accused person, a good amount of time may be lost and then the property may be disposed of. In order to maintain the status quo of that property so that this property is not disposed of, the enforcement directorate, looking at the urgency of the matter, can proceed to attach the property even though no charge sheet has been filed as provided under the first proviso or complaint has been filed before the magistrate or the court. Now, what you need to understand just, just now I have talked about that the offense of the money laundering can be meted out only when there is a scheduled offense. There may be a situation where no scheduled offense has been registered, but ED wants to attach the property because if they do not do so, it is likely that the property may be disposed of, which will frustrate the proceedings under this act. Now, what do we do in this situation? How do we strike the balance in here? So whenever we see that enforcement directorate needs to immediately attach the property, even though the scheduled offense was not registered, we must refer to section 66, subsection 2, which puts a mandatory obligation upon the enforcement directorate that immediately they must send a report to the relevant or appropriate investigating agency in the respective scheduled offense. So essentially, they will have to register the scheduled offense. Now, let's have a look at Proviso 3. Provided also that for the purposes of computing the period of 180 days, the period during which the proceedings under this section is stayed by the High Court shall be excluded and a further period of not exceeding 30 days from the date of vacation of such stay order shall be counted. Now, this third proviso has been added via 2019 amendment. Now, what usually happens in the real scenario? Let's say the enforcement directorate today has attached my property and I am the bona fide purchaser of this property. This property previously was held by someone who had made this property by utilizing the tainted money coming from the scheduled offense. Now, when ED is attaching my property, I have the remedy that I can go to the court and get the stay order saying that I am the bona fide purchaser of this property. So, when I file this application of the stay order, during the time which the stay order is pending before the relevant court, that period of time will be excluded when we calculate the period of 180 days. Now, when we look at the Proviso 3 carefully, it further says that 30 days shall also be excluded when the order of vacation of such stay order has been passed by the relevant High Court. Now, there may be some time which can be taken in communicating that the stay order has been vacated by that relevant court, High Court, to the enforcement agency under the PMLA court or to the any other court. So, the time period which is required for communicating the order for that 30 days latitude has been also included in the latter part of proviso number 3. Now, to make it more clear what we have done, we have made a comparison uh, when we talk about any person who has been charged under the scheduled offense and when we look at the second proviso, when we refer to 
any property of any person so two things are important person is charged of having committed a scheduled offense when we are referring to the proviso first as you can see on the left side that person is found to be in the possession of any proceeds of crime so this is uh, this is the proviso which is centered around a person who is charged with a scheduled offense now what are the preconditions as i have discussed final report is filed before the before the court under section 173 so we are referring to charge sheet a complaint has been filed by a person authorized to investigate under the investigate the offense before the magistrate if the proceeds of crime are located outside india now look at the second side when we refer to the second proviso any property of any person it starts with the non obstante clause meaning whatever has been provided in the first proviso would not be applicable in the situation or circumstances as mentioned in the second proviso that if the property is in the possession of any person who may not even be charged with this scheduled offense the property can still be attached therefore it is not possible for the director to wait for such report to be filed in respect of the properties and possession and enjoyment of persons not charged with the scheduled offense who would come within the scope of the second proviso to section 5 subsection 1 so what is the important condition in here that if ed does not attach the property it is likely to frustrate the proceeding under this act now we are continuing with the other subsections subsection 2 the director or any other officer not below the rank of deputy director shall immediately after the attachment order under subsection 1 forward the copy of the order along with the material in his possession refer to in that subsection to the adjudicating authority in a sealed envelope and in the manner as may be prescribed and such adjudicating authority shall keep such order and material for such period as may be prescribed so what is important in here the confidentiality has to be maintained when we look at the manner this manner has been provided under the 2005 rules appended to the pmla subsection 3 says every order of attachment made under subsection 1 shall cease to have effect after the expiry of period specified in that subsection or on the date of order made under subsection 3 of section 8 whichever is earlier now what does this mean that let's say the provisional attachment order has not been confirmed has not been confirmed in the civil proceedings of adjudication under section 8 and 180 days have already elapsed can ed still retain the attachment of this property the answer is no that order will automatically vacate on the expiry of 180 days what is important that the adjudicating authority must confirm the provisional attachment within the period of 180 days let's say that adjudicating authority has passed an order that this provisional attachment was invalid it should not have been attached by the enforcement directorate so what adjudicating authority is doing it is releasing the property saying that there is no material evidences which indicate that these looks like the proceeds of crime so let's say adjudicating authority passes this order on 140th day which is earlier than the expiry of 180 days so whatever period whichever period is earlier that on that date the property shall be released let's have a look at subsection 4 nothing in this section shall prevent the person interested in the enjoyment of immovable property attached under subsection 1 from such enjoyment explanation for the purposes of this subsection person interested in relation to any immovable property includes all persons claiming or entitled to claim any interest in the property now if we look at this subsection carefully when enforcement directorate makes provisional attachment order it is not depriving you from enjoying the 
possession of the property. Let's say that this property happens to be a commercial property from where one office is being run. Is it going to happen so that the office is going to be shut and all the employees will be thrown out? The answer is no. So if we look at the website of the Directorate of Enforcement, one can see that there is a list which the ED comes out with specifying that these are the properties which have been provisionally attached. So it does not deprive you from enjoying the possession of the property. However, these are being only provisionally attached to further see, to further say that this could be used in the aid of the civil proceedings of adjudication under section 8. Now let's have a look at subsection 5. The director or any other officer who provisionally attaches any property under subsection 1 shall within a period of 30 days from such attachment file a complaint stating the facts of such attachment before the adjudicating authority. Now when we look at subsection 5, the word which is being used here is file a complaint. So the enforcement directorate says that it is at this stage when the complaint is being registered and this complaint is called as original complaint. So the proceedings under PMLA prosecuting this person actually starts at this stage when the enforcement directorate files an original complaint under section 5, subsection 5 before the adjudicating authority. And this original complaint has to be filed within 30 days from the date when the ED attaches your property provisionally. So that is section 5 for you. If we were to sum up the requirements of section 5, these are as follows. That person is in the possession of the proceeds of crime. That such person is charged of having committed a scheduled offence. That such proceeds of crime are likely to be dealt with any manner, resulting in frustration of confiscating proceedings. So we need to understand why the attachment is done. One, it is to compel the attendance of the defendant. Many a times the defendant do not show up when the enforcement directorate is calling upon them. Second, to seize and hold his property for the payment of his debts. Sometimes we see that the person may have taken huge loan and they are unable to repay at these proceeds of crime that he was holding otherwise, which are coming from the tainted money. That will be attached so that it can be use as a means to secure the judgment or to be sold in the satisfaction of the judgment because the bank has to be repaid with this loan amount. So this is how the entire procedure is being done under section 5. Now coming to the civil proceedings part that is provided under section 8 which talks about adjudication. But we must ask what are we adjudicating? Are we adjudicating a person or are we adjudicating with, the ref with regard to the properties that have been provisionally attached by the Enforcement Directorate? Now, first let's understand the overview of Section 8 and then we will go into the provisions. When ED files the complaint under Section 5, Subsection 5 or the complaint is being filed under Section 17, Subsection 4, or the complaint has been filed under section 18 subsection 10. So when we talk about the complaint being filed under section 5 subsection 5, we are referring to the immovable property. Now in the previous session we discussed that some assets can be purchased by this person in question. So we are looking at the movable property or let's say the amount has been deposited in the bank. And for that bank account to be seized, we must get to the documents first. So what we are saying, the documents have been seized by the enforcement directorate, let's say under section 17. Or when we are talking about the bank account, we are going to freeze the bank account, meaning this person can no longer deal with the money that is deposited in the bank account. So these are what? These are the movable properties. So section 5 talks about immovable property, section 17 and 18 talks about 
movable property. So the complaint has been filed under these three relevant provisions. So once the adjudicating authority gets the complaint, what it will do? After having received the complaint, the adjudicating authority will serve the show cause notice upon the person. Who is this person? Who may be the accused under the scheduled offense and he is in the possession of the property, which are the proceeds of crime, or he may be someone who could be any person and he is in the possession of that property. So it could be anyone. What is the purpose of this show cause notice that please come to us and explain from where did you purchase this property, please reveal the source of it. If you can very well account for it, after hearing you, the adjudicating authority may pass the relevant order in your favor. But if it finds after taking into consideration all the material evidences, after hearing the enforcement directorate and after hearing you, it comes to the conclusion that these looks like the proceeds of crime, the adjudicating authority will record a finding. So where the finding is being recorded, it is recorded under subsection 2. After this, after having recorded that these are the proceeds of crime, the adjudicating authority will pass the confirmation order and this order is passed under subsection 3. That whether all or any property whether all or any of the properties are proceeds of crime. Now, once the adjudicating authority passes the confirmation order under section 8, subsection 3, clause A, it will continue, the attachment will continue for a period of 365 days, right? Now, when we talk about the final confiscation order, let's say the person has been convicted by the trial court under the offense of money laundering, the property stands confiscated in the name of the central government. Those provisions which are to be referred to are section 8 subsection 5, section 8 subsection 7 and when we talk about these two, we are talking about the properties which have been taken outside the country and there is something which are called as letter of request filed before the corresponding state. In short, they are also known as letter rogatories. Now, let's say the confirmation order has been passed by the uh, adjudicating authority. The enforcement directorate will immediately. The word written in here is under subsection 4 is forthwith. The adjudicating authority will immediately dispossess you from that property. After that, the trial will continue. When we look at this subsection, I had said in the period of 365 days, for the period of 365 days, the order can continue. Now, what does this mean? Does it mean that the adjudicating authority has to file the complaint before the special court before the expiry of this period? The answer is yes. So, let's say the trial has now begun before the special court, which can only lead to two conclusions. One is, the con one is the conviction under Money Laundering Act and the other one is the acquittal. So, in the case of conviction under subsection 5, confiscation will result. If the acquittal has been done in the trial of money laundering, the order of release to the person entitled. So, this is the flow chart what and how things progress under section 8. Now let's get to the subsections of section 8. Subsection 1, on receipt of the complaint under subsection 5 of section 5 or applications made under section 17 subsection 4 or section 18 subsection 10, if the adjudicating authority has a reason to believe. Again, once again we see that reason to believe has been used in here. That any person has committed an offence under section 3 or is in possession of proceeds of crime, he, it may serve a notice of not less than 30 days on such person calling upon him to indicate the sources of his income, earning or assets out of which or by means of which he has acquired the property attached under the subsection 1 of the relevant provisions. 
the evidence on which he relies and other relevant information and particulars and to show cause why all or any of such properties should not be declared to be the properties involved in the money laundering and confiscated by the central government. So as discussed, this part talks about the show cause notice. What is the meaning of show cause notice? That please come to us and explain from where you have derived this property. If you have sufficient explanation, it will be in your favor. If you cannot disclose the relevant information, it can be held against you. Now, let's imagine a scenario where this property is being held by not only one person, but there are multiple people who have right to this property. The notice will be served on all the persons that has been provided on proviso number one. Provided that where a notice under subsection specifies any property as being held by a person on behalf of any other person, a copy of such notice shall also be served upon such other person. So in this proviso, we are referring to the Benami transaction that you are the one who is exercising the control, but it is being held in the name of another person. As I said previously, the concept that I was referring to is discussed under the second proviso that is provided further that where such property is held jointly by more than one person, such notice shall be served to all persons holding such property. Now after hearing the, after serving the show cause notice uh, under subsection 2, a fair opportunity of hearing will be given to all the interested parties. On one side, the person who has been holding the property and on the other side, the enforcement directorate who, which will be represented by the director or the other officials. So it says the adjudicating authority shall after considering the reply if any to the notice issued under subsection 1, hearing the aggrieved person and the director or any other officer authorized by him in this behalf and taking into account all the relevant materials placed on the record before him by an order, record a finding whether all or any properties referred to in the notice issued under subsection 1 are involved in money laundering. Let's say the notice was served with regard to five properties and out of these five properties, the person was able to account for three properties. So these three properties would be released at that stage itself and two properties will be attached by the confirmation order. Provided that further, if the property is claimed by a person other than a person to whom the notice had been issued, such person shall also be given an opportunity of being heard to prove that the property is not involved in money laundering. So some other person has a claim to this property and he was not served the notice, but he got to know later on, this person can also be heard. So we can see that if we look at the to subsection, the principles of natural justice are being adopted in here, the right of fair opportunity of hearing. Under subsection 3, that is important, wherein the confirmation order is being passed, it says, where adjudicating authority decides under subsection 2 that any property is involved in money laundering, he shall, by an order in writing, confirm the attachment of the property made under subsection 1 of section 5 or retention of property or record seize or frozen under 17 or 18 and record a finding to that effect whereupon such attachment or retention or freezing of the seize of frozen property or record shall. Now look at this clause A. It shall continue during investigation for a period not exceeding 365 days or the pendency of proceedings relating to any offence under the Act before a court or under the corresponding law of any other country before the competent court of criminal jurisdiction outside India as the case may be. So the second limb of it refers to the outbound flows where the property has been taken outside the country. So what we are following here that we are not depriving the person of his right to enjoy the property without following the due process. So this attachment will remain valid for a period of 365 days. Now clause B will become relevant at the stage of conclusion of trial. Conclusion of trial of what? 
there are two trials that take place under the ambit of the money laundering one for the scheduled offense and second for the money laundering offense so the minute the conviction under the scheduled offense is being done or been upheld immediately the confiscation order after hearing the money laundering offense the confiscation order will be passed by the court at that stage the enforcement directorate will confiscate the property that property does not belong to you it stands transferred in the name of the state and the state in here is represented by the central government now let's look at clause b this order of attachment shall become final after the order of confiscation which is passed under subsection 5 or subsection 7 of section 8 or section 58b or subsection 2a of the section 60 by the special court explanation says for the purposes of computing the period of 365 days under clause a the period during which the investigation is stayed by any court under any law for the time being in force shall be excluded like how we discussed one of the provisos under section 5 a similar proviso has been added in here so one if one goes to the high court and gets the stay order the period of 365 days shall be computed in such a way that as long as the stay order was in operation that period will be excluded now have a look at subsection 4 where the provisional order of attachment made under subsection 1 of section 5 has been confirmed under subsection 3 the director or any other officer authorized by him in this behalf shall forthwith take the possession of the property attached under section 5 or frozen under subsection 1a of section 17 in such manner as may be prescribed so what we are looking here that the enforcement directorate will immediately take the possession of the property from you however in some situations it is not practicable that the enforcement directorate can take over the physical possession in that scenario what will be done it will be frozen provided that if it is not practicable to take possession of a property frozen under subsection 1a of section 17 the order of confiscation shall have the same effect as if the property had been taken possession of so what we are creating here we are creating a legal fiction here as if the possession is with the enforcement directorate now what when we were referring to that the conviction has taken place in the offense of money laundering the what will be the effect the property will stand confiscated in the name of the central government it's provided in here where on conclusion of a trial of the offense under this act the special court finds that the offense of money laundering has been committed it shall order that such property involved in the money laundering or which has been used for the commission of offense of money laundering shall stand confiscated to the central government now where this has been done for this you have to refer to section 9 we have a statutory provision giving this right in the name of the central government that now you will be the owner of this property it may be sold in the auction if you want to pay off the debt if the circumstances of the case is such another possible scenario in that trial of money laundering could be that on the conclusion of the trial under this act the special court finds that the offense of money laundering has not taken place and the property is not involved in the money laundering it shall order the release of such property to the person entitled to receive it now when we talk about this aspect it is very important for us to know that in so many cases where the acquittal takes place in the money laundering offense the property is not automatically released by the enforcement directorate the person would then be resorting to filing an application before the relevant court that since the acquittal has taken place in the offense of money laundering this property shall be released in my name because it was not involved in any manner in the proceeds of crime now you must think that whether this person needs to wait till the time when the trial of the money laundering is over so imagine the trial takes years and years 
So are we going to deprive this person of having the possession of this property? Now this was the gap which was identified and it has been taken care of after the 2019 amendment. Now the person can file an application before the court where the trial is being heard and say that I am the bona fide purchaser of this property and I can account for its legitimacy. So the court in this case, which is the special court, trial court can hear both the sides that is the enforcement directorate and the person in question who is claiming this property. After hearing both the sides, if court comes to the conclusion that this person is the bona fide purchaser, even before the trial is concluded, the court may release the property to the rightful claimant of it. Now let's refer to section 7 in this context. Where the trial under this act cannot be conducted by a reason of death of the accused or the accused been declared as a proclaimed offender or for any other reason or having commenced but not con could not be concluded, the special court shall on an application moved by the director or a person claiming to be entitled to the possession of the property in respect of which an order has been passed under subsection 3 of the 8 pass appropriate orders regarding confiscation or release of the property as the case may be involved in the offence of money laundering after having regard to the material before it. So this is exactly what we had just explained with the help of the example. Now subsection 8 is another important that a uh, innocent person has been suffering with quantifiable loss. He may move the application under the provision and the court can hear and the court can conduct a hearing on this. Now when we were talking about that scenario this proviso in particular becomes relevant that court may release the property even before the conclusion of the trial. For this to understand we first need to refer to the operating part. Where a property stands confiscated to the central government under subsection 5. The special court in such manner as may be prescribed may also direct the central government to restore such confiscated property or part thereof to a claimant with a legitimate interest in the property who may have suffered a quantifiable loss as the result of the money laundering. So who is this property that, who is this person who are we talking about? It is the innocent or the bona fide purchaser who had purchased this property and he had to suffer because this property was being sold by the person who was involved in the process of money laundering and this person can move the application even before the trial. Now let's have a look at this. Provided further that special court may if it thinks fit consider a claim of the claimant for the purposes of restoration of such property during the trial of the case in such manner as may be prescribed. So what is the phrase that has been used here during the trial? So it need not wait until the trial is concluded under the money laundering act. So we must refer to one judgment which has been passed recently that is Parvati Kollur state represented by the enforcement directorate 2022 Supreme Court. In this case what has happened the husband was being pronounced innocent in the scheduled offense meaning no trial can be continued in the money laundering act and when this person was acquitted in the scheduled offense after that he had died. Now along with this person his wife and children were also being taken into the loop. So these people the wife and the children had moved the application before the court saying that, that since the main accused has been acquitted under the scheduled offense the trial under the money laundering has automatically come to an end against this person but these two people should also be given back the property that was attached by the uh, adjudicating authority in the confirmation order. So this judgment makes clarification that when the person is acquitted you cannot proceed against the attachment belonging to those people who have the rightful claim to it. So today we have tried to understand the attachment proceedings under the context of section 5 and section 8. Thank you.